Hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I want to welcome you back to this amazing video series that we're doing with Brother Mill. And uh, we have been going through uh, a number of standard Islamic narrative elements and showing that they are sketchy at best. That's why we call this series Holes in the Narrative, why the standard Islamic narrative is sketchy. Today, we're going to talk about a very interesting topic, actually, and that's the origin of Eid al-Fitr. Now, if you know anything about Eid al-Fitr, this is the uh, breaking of the fast celebration that uh, comes at the heels of Ramadan. Immediately after Ramadan finishes, the next day, usually there is usually three days of celebration to break the fast, and we call it Eid al-Fitr, Eid for celebration, al-Fitr meaning to break in of the fast, technically speaking. So with that, uh, of course, uh, background, we wanna introduce here our brother Mel, who is joining us remotely. Thank you so much, brother, as always, for taking the time to be here with us now. We're really interested, and we uh, you whet our appetite about this. Uh, you know, no pun intended here. So what's the deal with Eid al-Fitr? Well, welcome. Uh, um, let me edit that bit out. Um, great to be back uh, to talk to you again. Um, Eid al-Fitr is really important because Islam claims to be a monotheistic religion with monotheistic roots. And when you delve into the history of this feast, you discover that there's a pagan connection. And that's what I'm going to explore with you today. Wonderful. So, where did the Ramadan fast and Eid al-Fitr festival come from? One thing we can rule out straight away, it didn't come from Christianity or Judaism. So the answer is actually quite surprising. It lies way up north in Haran. I think we're seeing a theme. Whenever we delve into these things, we keep coming across a northern um, explanation, a northern origin to Islam. And yeah, look I, mean, I, I would say this is the only Haran connection is. to Abraham, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're talking about um, a festival that goes way back in time. So that's 4,000 years old, and it comes from way up in Haran. And uh, there's a surprising link that exists between the moon god Sen. So at this time, I'm not referring to the standard Islamic narrative, but the moon god Sen and Ramadan and Eid al-Fitr. Now, is, is this moon god connected to Baal, by the way? I haven't delved into that. Um, I, I, w I wouldn't be able to tell you off, offhand. I'd have to look into, okay. to the, into that, but I, I haven't really focused on that for this. All right. Um, but it's, in it's interesting that the last you made Caliph, Marwan II, 744-750, built his palace on the ruined site of the Temple of Sin in Haran. That's a very odd place to to build his palace just you know could have built it anywhere but he built it there here we see a direct link from an ancient cult to the moon god sin and the islamic practice of ramadan and eid al-fitr and i'm sure for many of you this may seem really surprising that there could be this link um, but there's very strong evidence as i'm going to show you so it's just a little bit of a background the moon god Sen in the Mesopotamian religion was the father of the sun god Shamash and of Ishtar, otherwise known as Aphrodite, and with them formed an astral triad of deities. Now, astral means like planetary or to do with the sun or the moon or planets and so on. And it's interesting that St. John of Damascus links the black stone to Aphrodite, which is Ishtar. Okay, so that's just a a side note. Now, originally the word Sen comes from Suen, which got contracted, and it designated the crescent moon. Okay. Now, if we look at the map here, um, way down in southern Iraq, there, there's a place called Nippur. Each spring, Sen's worshippers reenacted his mythological visit to his father Enlil at Nippur, southern Iraq with a ritual journey carrying with them the first dairy products of the year. And I just point out as well that the, the god Sen was also referred to as Nana as well. So that's an alternative for Sen. So we can see it's still a northern narrative. We're talking about Haran and we're talking about southern Iraq in relation to this. Okay. Now, um, from this source, which is up at the top, I won't read it. 
The, so the Sabians are divided into two groups, the Mandanes and the Haranians. Now, the, the Mandanes are more polytheistic. The Haranians, while still being polytheistic, they had a pantheon. They emphasized um, the moon god Sen as like the father god in the, the pantheon. And the, it almost, it's like a, a first step towards monotheism, but not quite. So the Haranians were moon worshippers that worshipped uh, the moon god Sen, or Nana, as I've mentioned, as their main deity, along with the other deities, and they considered their god greater than the others. Now, what is one of the phrases that Muslims typically say about Allah? Oh, um, uh, I mean, subhanahu wa ta'ala, for instance, one of it, Jalla Jalla. Yeah. Uh, well, the one I'm, uh, that springs to mind for me is uh, Allah Hu Akbar, which is that's true. Allah is yeah. is the greater. That's right. Now, you know, if you were to go back in time four thousand years ago to Haran, and you were to ask them who is the greater God, they would immediately say Sin. The God Sin is the greater God because that's who they had at the top of their. And he's greater uh, than other gods, technically speaking. He's, Not the greatest, yeah. but greater than the others. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the gr greater than the others is, is how they would view it. So it's an interesting link even just at that point of, of the discussion here. Um, now, what's also interesting is um, what has a 30-day fast got to do with the moon god Sin? Um, so I found this a little bit here. Dr. Bayard Dodge, lovely name there, in the Sabians of Haran explains that mythological origins of Haran's worship of the moon explain the disappearance of the moon after it joined with the star cluster uh, Pleiades in the zodiac of Taurus. It happened during the third week of March. The people prayed to the moon, pleading for its return to the city of Haran, but the moon refused to return. This is believed to be the explanation for why they fasted during this month. The moon did not promise to return to Haran, but it did promise to return to Deir Kadi, a temple near one of the gates of the city of Haran. The worshippers of Sen or Nana went to Deir Kadi after this month to celebrate and to welcome the return of the moon. So this is 4,000 years ago. We got a 30-day fast. They are waiting for the return of the moon god Sen. And then once he, the, in the, the myths that the moon god returns, they have a celebration for that return. Mm -hmm. Any guesses what this festival was called 4,000 years ago? Let me guess. Have a guess. Eagle Futter? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's what they called. Is that, is that a coincidence? I don't think so. Of course. According to, yeah. according to 10th century historian Ibn al-Nadim, the Haranians called the feast Al-Fitr. The spelling is different because it's, um, it was originally in Akkadian and then in um, Sumerian. I may have got the which came first wrong there, but it was in both of those two languages. Um, so it's the same name by which the feast of the Islamic Ramadan is called Feast of Al-Fitr, um, or that, that should be the, the feast at the end of Ramadan. When Muslims celebrate Eid al-Fitr, the breaking of the fast, they say numerous takbirs, Allah is greater. This echoes the idea that the moon god Sin is greater than the other gods, at least in the, in the earlier festival. Now, it was moved from the month of Rajab, which is the month around March, to Ram Ramadan. Wow, I, I mean, this, that's the seventh month of the Islamic uh, calendar. Yeah. Hence the reason the fast is called Ramadan and not Rajab. If they had retained its position in the calendar during the month of Rajab, it would have been really obvious that it's connected with the moon god Sen. Hmm. Maybe, just maybe, the reason they moved it might be to avoid it being so obvious. We don't know. We don't know exactly why they moved it, but in any case, they moved it from spring to summer. And that is convenient because it 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 hates that um, connection. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what we're missing in the explanation for for all of this is how it went from being a practice up in Haran to something practiced in Arabia in pre-Islamic times, which Islam then just took over. So, you know, that's the big 
nub of the question. And so I did some digging and this is what I found out. So what's interesting is we do know how it actually became a practice in Arabia. And this is, as I say, fascinating. The last king of Babylon, Nabonidus, who reigned from 556 to 539 BC, attempted to elevate sin to a supreme position within the pantheon. Nabonidus went in self-imposed exile and started proselytizing at Tema in northern Arabia. His son, uh, Belshazzar, became regent, and it was he who was given the writing upon the wall warning from God. Now, I know you spoke to Dr. Joel. Is it Dr. Richard Joel? Uh, the, uh, Joel Richardson, yeah. Oh, sorry, Joel Richardson. Sorry, got it mixed yeah. up. Um, I know he he referred to uh, Belshazzar, and uh, I thought mm -hmm. this this bit here was a nice link with what he spoke about. Um, one sanctuary that has been found dedicated to the god Sen was found at Sumara. Uh, sorry, I'll say that again. At Sumatar, um, Harabesi, close to Edessa and Haran, and is dated to the third century AD. So it is fair to suppose that the cult survived into Islamic times. We're not talking about a huge time before. We're not, it didn't just end in uh, the sixth century BC, but it carried on. We can definitely say it carried on into the third century AD and probably carried on till the seventh century and then was just taken over. Um, this cult was spread right through uh, many parts of Arabia and those um, Arabs who were pagan practice this cult um, into the seventh and eighth century. And so therefore, when Islam began, this got incorporated into their religion. That's my, my take on it. Now, there's a very interesting thing about uh, Belshazzar's feast, which actually, as I'm going to argue, was the feast of al Fitr. That's a bit of a bombshell. Mm -hmm. Daniel 5.1 says that King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. The most important festival in the Haran calendar was the Feast of Al-Fitr. This is the, the festival that God intervenes and puts the writing on the wall, warning Belshazzar that his kingdom was soon to be ended. Mm -hmm. um, so at the end of that chapter, it says that that very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Babylonians, was slain. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. That's an amazing uh, detail. God passes judgment, not just on Belshazzar, but on this feast of El Fitr and of all of this practice, Ram the Ramadan, which was R Rajab at, at that time. And this, and all of the work that his father did in proselytizing, even into Arabia, all of that fell under God's judgment. And this is recorded in the Bible. Um, so that's incredible. And what a festival for Islam to inherit. Why did they pick a festival that the Bible condemns in the clearest terms? Because it was a pagan festival. Instead of um, worshipping the, the God of the Jews, which is uh, Yahweh, these pagans were, were worshipping Sen, the, God, you know, the moon god Sen and, and the others. Um, and, uh, and as punishment, God basically took away the, um, the kingdom of the Babylonians. And just another little detail in the Bible, it says that they used um, wine cups that were found in Jerusalem. They took the, the wine cups from the Jews and used it as part of this pagan festival. And that was the, the trigger for God intervening and saying, no, you are taking sacred objects and using them for a pagan uh, festival. This is not acceptable. And um, so they were condemned for that. Yep. Um, and to, what's really, this gets better and better because in 1956, um, an archaeologist by the name of Dr. D.S. Rice discovered four stella, which are rocks uh, with inscriptions on them, down in the foundation of none other than a mosque in Haran, in, uh, as I said, in 1956. 
And this was on the site of an old temple dedicated to the moon god Sen. And they contain inscriptions on behalf of Nebuchadnezzar and his mother, bragging about his exploits to spread this cult of Sen far and wide, particularly in Arabia. So this is amazing that they found this. And I love the fact that it was found in the foundation of a mosque of all places. Um, so here are some of the translations from that. Um, down at the bottom here is uh, one of the stele has a depiction of Nebuchadnezzar. And in the, the next one here, um, we have another inscription. Um, and this one, it's an inscription from Nebuchadnezzar. And he, he basically talks about his work spreading the cult of Sen in various places, including places way down in Iraq and into Arabia. Um, and here's another one here. Um, you can see it's, there's a re reference to Tema in Arabia there and a few other places as well. Um, so I, I found this um, about a year ago and I was blown away by this. So we have um, a pagan cult to the moon god Sen. Uh, we have a con condemnation of it by God recorded in the Bible. We have proof that this Babylonian king propagated it in Arabia, and we know that Islam took up this festival and called it by the exactly the same name, Al-Fitr, as part of a supposedly monotheistic religion of Islam. So wonderful. So my verdict is both Ramadan and Eid Al-Fitr are both directly inherited from a pagan polytheistic cult dedicated to the moon god Sen. So I'll hand back to you. Wonderful, brother. Thank you so much for sharing this, of course. And now uh, we're looking forward really to our next episode. This time we're going to talk about art revealing Muhammad, if uh, if I remember correctly. Yeah, um, so it'll be interesting to look at how Muhammad is depicted in art over the centuries. Of course, many Muslims are unaware that Muslims had been drawn Muhammad for centuries. So that'll be our topic uh, during the next video. Wonderful. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you, everyone, for... Uh, following along and uh, hope to see you again next time. God bless. Take care. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel Sierra International and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.